apologies from Councillor Mike Cairns, Jimmy Marr, and James Roberts. Any other apologies? <coughs> any declarations of interest from any members in relation to any items of the agenda? An interest on agenda item 6, the home, home safety strategy by the Tribune trustee of the Fire Support Network. Okay. Yeah. And exactly the same as Leslie and members of the FSM. Okay. Anybody else? Items uh, to be presented as a matter of agency. Um, there's two pieces of, of uh, one item on the agenda uh, is the exclusion of the and public, which is item 12 regarding the ICT contract. And there's also <coughs> item 5, exempt information page 191 on the financial breakdown of the uh, cost of the lines. Uh, if anybody wishes to ask any questions on that particular item, uh, item 5, please let us know. Otherwise, we'll have to exclude uh, members of the press board for that item. Otherwise, we can just continue straight on to item 12. Okay. Item 2 is minutes of the previous meeting. Are they agreed? Agreed. Okay. Item 3 is station <coughs> members of the progress report. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> the purpose of this report is to update the authority on progress made to date with the station managers program. Paragraphs 3 and 4 on pages 13 and 14 detail the background to the station managers program, which you will be well aware of by now. <coughs> paragraphs 6 to 8 on pages 14 to 15 provide an update on Allerton, which, while it's not strictly speaking uh, being the station manager, still features within the report due to the requirement to dispose of the station following its closure on the 1st of April of this year. The officers are working with colleagues from Liverpool City Council and Merseyside Police over the future use of the fire station, the police station and the library as part of the One Public Estate programme. And further details on proposals will be reported to members as they are developed. Moving on to Prescott, paragraphs 9 to 20 on pages 15 to 16, provides an update on the Prescott merger. The key point to highlight is contained within paragraph 18, which advises that a full plan and application has been submitted on the 6th of November, which will be considered by the Mosley Planning Committee on the 14th of January. If planning permission is received, the intention is to commence work on site on the 29th of February with a build period of 12 months. Paragraph 19 provides reassurances to members over the efforts being made to encourage local companies to bid to be included on the list of subcontractors for the <coughs> project and also to promote the use of apprentices. Paragraph 20 provides reassurances to members that discussions <coughs> continue with North West Ambulance Service over the abortive design and delay costs which have incurred following on from their withdrawal from the project. Paragraphs 21 to 30 on pages 16 to 18 provide an update on the Sorgon Massey merger. A pre-application for advice has been submitted to Will by the Council on the 8th of October and a planning meeting was held with planning officers from Will on the 4th of November. The following on from this week, a letter from Will planning officers <coughs> was sent to the agents acting on behalf of the authority but unfortunately was given to a Will councillor beforehand. That letter was subsequently passed on to the Liverpool Echo and the Will Globe, who ran a story quoting sections of the letter, claiming that was before we had, uh, we'd had sight of that. I've since written, uh, written to the head of regeneration plan of the Will, raising a number of issues that relate to that, and they are outlined within paragraph 26. Paragraph 27 details the position of the medium pressure gas main, which runs on the land. If following on from the plan and advice, the size of the station, the design that we, we would intend to submit a plan and application on, has been significantly reduced to the point where the medium pressure gas main would no longer run underneath the main building 
thus negating the requirement for the team to use it. It's our intention to submit a full plan and application and take into account the pre-planning advice that we've received from Will at some point either this month or early January, which would allow for consideration by the planning committee uh, at some point next year, possibly in April. Paragraph 30 makes the point that any decision by Will to grant planning permission will almost certainly be referred to the Secretary of State. I need to make it clear to members at this point that if planning permission is not granted, then the inevitable consequence will be the outright closure of West Kirby Fire Station with the resultant increase in response times. Moving on to St Helens, there are two reports on the agenda today that relate to the St Helens merge, the first of which details the, the outcomes of the consultation process and the second of which details the operational options. The substantive point for members to note is that agreements being reached at Pilkington's over the purchase of the land at Watson Street, which is the, the Canal Street works, subject to the authority approving the merger proposal, clearly, satisfactory ground conditions and plan permission being granted. At this point now, we have no agreement over, uh, with, with this site and it's all Northwest Ambulance Service over the shared use of the site. However, in the event that members do uh, approve the recommendations of the, 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 the report uh, to the members on, on the agenda, then further detailed discussions will be held with both organisations to try to secure their, uh, their involvement in any project. <coughs> Well, it's up to date, a quality's impact assessment on the mergers programme is attached to Appendix 9 to report CFO 9215, which is the next report on the, uh, the agenda. I'll, uh, I'll pause at that point, members, to take any questions that you might have on the report. Okay, thank you. Any questions or from members? <coughs> Um, can we just put on my board our thanks and appreciation to all our officers involved with this because there's a lot of work uh, involved with these um, measures and obviously the closure for Alison. So, you know, if, uh, if we can record that, I think it's uh, important because of uh, the pressures that are on the nerves that uh, we appreciate all the work that's been by all our staff. So, if we can record our thanks. And with that, can the recommendation be approved? Agreed. 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 Uh, the outcome of the consultation from <coughs> Thanks, Chair. The purpose of this report is to advise members of the 12 week public consultation process over the proposal to merge the existing stations in Eccleston and St Helens at a new station at Canal Street, or as an alternative to close the station at Eccleston outright. In both options, one appliance would remain crude on a whole time basis and the other would be crewed whole time retained by whole time staff on a 30 minute recall uh, principle which by now you are well familiar with. As members will be aware, the reason for this proposal, as indeed for all of the merger proposals, is to meet the savings target as a result to the in-year cuts to the authority budget for this year, 15-16. The 12-week consultation process commenced on the 3rd of August and concluded on the 25th of October. <coughs> the process consisted of an online questionnaire, three deliberative focus groups facilitated by Opinion Research Services, three public <coughs> meetings and a stakeholder breakfast meeting. A summary of the outcomes of all of those consultation events provided on pages 22 and 23 and I will return to those outcomes momentarily. <coughs> Paragraphs 5 to 9 on pages 23 and 24 describe how the process was promoted and marketed. The consultation document, which is attached to the report at Appendix 1, was posted online on the service website and distributed widely across the Eccleston and the St. Louis station areas. This included 633 copies of the document being delivered by hand to the properties in the vicinity of Canal Street. The process was also publicised through the service Facebook and Twitter accounts and through mainstream media. The consultation events to which I've referred previously are listed in paragraphs 11 to 16 on pages 24 and 25. 
The only comment of MAFE members at this point is that the public consultation events were not well attended by members of the public. Councillors outnumbered members of the public significantly at the meetings, which was our experience in the museum. <coughs> that point may be gained in more detail within the new calls at paragraph 36 on page 28. The analysis of the responses to the questionnaire is detailed in appendix 4 and summarised at the report, or within your report, sorry, in paragraph 17 to 22, which are on pages 25 and 26. There were 64 responses to the survey, the significant majority of which, 82%, were supportive of the proposal to close Eccleston and St. Helens and build a new station at Canal Street. 81% of the respondents disagreed with the proposal to close the <coughs> scale outright, so broadly identical in their support for one and an opposition to the other. The analysis of the outcomes from the focus groups and forums are detailed in Appendix 5. It's also <coughs> summarised within the report of paragraphs 23 to 31, which is on pages 26 through 28. The overall conclusions from the focus groups and the forum were that the Canal Street merger proposal was supported by the attendees. The summary of the questions raised at stake the stakeholder and public meetings is detailed in Appendix 6. And that's in there, and that's contained in paragraphs 32 to 37 on pages 28 to 29 of the report. Paragraph 37 outlines a summary of the public meetings which the outcomes of which was that the attendees generally understood the position that the authority finds itself in and were therefore supportive of the proposal. The issue was raised over why stations in Liverpool were not being closed before those in St. Helens. I explained at the meetings that that decision was predicated on the opportunity to bid into the Transformation and Efficiencies Fund for capital to support the new build of Canal Street and that this funding may not be available in the future. I also explain that it is almost inevitable that further stations will need to close in the future as a result of the cuts that we've been made aware of today and that Ian will speak to later, and they will invariably be in Liverpool. Paragraphs 38 to 40 on page 29 describe meetings held with MPs and other stakeholders, including the partner organisations who currently occupy space at St. Helens Fire Station. Paragraphs 41 to 43 on pages 29 to 30 provide details, <coughs> correspondence and requests for information. Members will note the support of comments from the Rainford Parish Council and Conor McGinn MP, the latter of which is quoted in paragraph 42. Further details of correspondence with councillors is contained at appendices 7 and 8. Comments from the staff, uh, from our staff in St. Helens in relation to the consultation are listed in paragraph 44. As I alluded to and speaking to the previous report, the, reply, uh, the revised equalities impact assessment is attached to appendix 9 with a summary of the analysis of the St. Helens process provided within the report of paragraphs 45 to 49, which is on pages 30 to 32. <coughs> Breakdown of the cost of the process is provided at paragraphs 52, which was just over £12,000 in total. Uh, before I conclude, members, I'd just like to take you back to the recommendations of the report, which is in paragraph 2 on page 21. To just remind you what it is that you're being asked to do with this report, which is to note the outcomes of the comprehensive and informative St. Helens public consultation and to take full and carefully consider the count of these, uh, these outcomes when you're considering the next report on the agenda. Uh, pause at that point, Chair, to get the questions. Any questions or comments on this Myself and Councillor Rose attended the three public meetings and the Chief's right, they were not well attended. So it was good to get information from this of what happened with the partners and the forums, especially that was worth reading. 
I'd also like to make comments about the public not being there because I did ask why weren't we there? We put it out in the cell, we put it out in the echo, what's wrong? And what's coming back to me is that people have just got austerity fatigue. They are sick to death of listening about the cuts that's going on. But I would like to put on record my thanks to the existing councillors. They're not of my political persuasion, but they have been very, very supportive throughout this consultation. The purpose of this report is to request that the authority, after having considered the previous report, support the proposal to merge the existing fire stations at Eccleston and St Helens at the new station in Power Street. The recommendations of the report listed at paragraph 2 on page 181. Paragraph 5 of the report on page 182 summarises the outcomes of the consultation process where which as you previously heard, that the overall majority of those participating throughout the merger proposal and uh, throughout the consultation process all thought that the proposal was reasonable in the circumstances. Paragraph 6 on page 182 detail the issues raised by our staff during the process. <coughs> My responses to those issues are contained within paragraph 7 to 10 on pages 182 and 183. <coughs> Members have previously approved the merger of the existing Heighton and Western fire stations at the new station at Prescott, which should be operation, uh, operational by February 2017, as I've reported in the first report on the agenda. The appliance at the new station at Prescott would make the first or second response in to the existing. Eccleston station area. Prior to the completion of the Prescott build, I will endeavour to maintain the availability of the Eccleston appliance for as long <coughs> as possible between now and February 2017 when we should have the new station operational at Prescott. Members need to be aware, however, that that may not be possible for the reasons that are detailed within paragraphs 15 to 19 in the report on which I will speak to momentarily. At the point at which it is no longer possible to maintain the availability of the appliance at Eccleston, the personnel who are currently based there will be transferred to surrounding stations. Paragraphs 11 and 12 on page 183 refer to other options raised during the process. The only solely operationally focused suggestion was to close Newton in order to maintain St Helens as a two-pump station. I explain in paragraph 13 why this is not a viable option, which, in the interest of completeness, I'll just read directly from now, so it's important just to get this point on the record. As members are aware, Newton's a PFI station, so it would be very difficult to close for a number of practical reasons which would be self-evident. The Newton appliance is crewed on the low level of activity and risk duty system and has an allocation of 16 whole town equivalent firefighter posts against <coughs> four firefighter posts which are allocated to the station in Eccleston and St Helens. So even if the authority were to close <coughs> and move the fire engine and therefore the staff over to St Helens, it wouldn't deliver any revenue saving at all made clear during the public meetings that the revenue savings are delivered through the reduction of firefighter posts. Unfortunately, that is how we make our savings. It's 
It's also made clear that by reducing the number of firefighter posts, then that reduces the number of fire engines that the authority can maintain on a whole time basis, and therefore the associated impact on response times, which was made clear at, uh, at all the meetings. And that wasn't just for the first response, that was for the second response. At present, there is no firm commitment from North West Ambulance Service or Merseyside Police to share the proposed new station as I alluded to previously. However, if members do approve the recommendations of this report, then dialogue will continue with NWAS and Merseyside Police until such time as officers are in a position to submit a plan and application. You will note members are not saying until such time as agreement is reached because if we can't reach agreement with either organisation by the point at which a plan and application is ready to submit, then it will get submitted because we cannot wait indefinitely for other organisations to make decisions on whether they're in or not. Paragraphs 15 to 19 in the report describe the interim crew arrangements prior to the completion of the rebuild. <coughs> These are in summary to maintain the appliance of ethyl cyanide on a whole time basis for as long as we're able to, noting that the new station in Prescott should, all things being equal, be operational by February 2017. But that in any event, the second appliance will, and indeed is now, located at St. Helens Crew on a whole time return basis. Paragraphs 20 to 22 on page. 185 describe the alternative option considered during the consultation process, which is the outright closure of Eccleston. To be clear, members, it's my very strong recommendation that you approve the proposal to merge the existing stations at Eccleston and St. Helens at the new station or at a new station in Canal Street. Previously highlighted the equality's impact assessment when I spoke to the previous report. As members are well aware, the reason the merger is being proposed is to deal with the in-year cuts to the authority budget for this financial year. This is not something I would recommend if we had any other alternative, but to have to consider closures of stations. It's clear <coughs> what this is. Financial implications are contained in the paragraph 28 to 30 on page 186. But in summary, <coughs> The revenue savings from this proposal are required to balance this year's budget. So we either now need to, uh, we need to approve the merger or we need to approve the closure of St. Helens outright. We don't have any other options that we can pursue. I'll pause at that point, members, to take any questions that you might have. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Any questions? Wait. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, Chair, thanks for Chief, the um, question I'm asking is, is, is based upon the two major, last two major reports you put forward. Will once the closure has taken place and before the new build actually is up and running, will there be any difference to the service we provide? If, if there is, what steps are you taking to ensure that you know everything is covered as much as you possibly can? The, uh, that, that's contained within the in the report. That is the reference to trying to maintain the Atkinson yeah, right. fire engine whole time crewed for as long as we are able to do so. And if we are able to, until such time as the new station in Prescott is built, because once we have the new station in Prescott, then that will provide a uh, certainly <coughs> provide the first response into parts of the existing St. Uh, Eccleston area, i.e. Eccleston Park, for example. And it will certainly provide probably as quick a response to the uh, so Thato Heath, Muckrow, potentially Rainhill. Um, certainly what was the old Western Station area, the uh, or parts of the uh, parts of St. Helens which are now covered by uh, or, or, or were covered by Western. I don't think anybody in this room wants to see us get rid of 22 firefighters of course, and that's what it comes down to. It comes down to a saving of £864,000, but we have to do it. We 
we have to do it or somebody else will come in and do it for us. In my opinion, past doctoral is not fit for purpose. <coughs> be. And it would be better to have a place within the town centre, an area of regeneration uh, that's moving forward, new hotels going in that area, new bowling alleys going in that area. So to me, this is going in the right place. It's with a very, very heavy heart that we have to cut in St. Helens. My opinion. I understand that being in Canal Street will cause certain areas of the borough to get the first engine there quicker, but I do have concerns about the second engine, but I fully support the Chief. Uh, we, this is what we have to do, and it's with a very, very <coughs> important that I make these recommendations. Just a second recommendation. Um, and to put forward my attempts to the officers um, in what, even though there's only a small number of people, was quite a heated meeting when I got there. A, a number of people called and didn't seem to have any grasp or understanding of what was actually being proposed. And, uh, again, thanks to Dan for uh, showing great restraint in how we actually cope with that. Um, yeah, no one wants to say, I think Dan sums it up with. Um, we didn't want to uh, just put the stick on the um, <laughs> which is quite an apt saying to say that not good news, it's awful news, it's awful news that we're getting rid of firefighters, and it's awful news that we shouldn't have the fire stations. Um, and I'll probably carry on, I think we'll carry on at the end of the day. The thing that got me most was the numbers of people who turned up, um, and whether people are sick of hostility and that sort of thing. It was like a message to say, we're not interested in the fire service, and we're not interested in the police. We're only interested when it's in our house, and the house is on fire, and if, you know, we want somebody to clean the house. That's when you feel like we're interested in the fire service. And that, that sums up, um, I think, a lot of what's going on in our society. People are losing um, the respectable things, and not being concerned about what is actually happening what is happening with these books and people's lives are now more and more at risk. I mean, we saw it before, I think the numbers of fire-related deaths are increasing in the cities, and that's down to the courts. <coughs> Prime Minister said thanks to the officers, and thanks to you know, what, what I care. Nobody wants it to do it. At the end of the day, it's all good news. <coughs> say that um, so I agree with some of the comments that have been made so far. It, it is a very difficult decision for the authority to make. You know, I don't think any of us as elected members actually, you know, put ourselves forward as councillors to be placed on this authority to actually close fire stations or indeed let firefighters or other members of staff go because of the fantastic work they do on our behalf. And it, you know it just makes you it makes you laugh really or the news about some of the comments that are made by certain civil servants and certain government ministers have comments and saying the, the cuts have made any significant impact. I just wonder what planet they live in, because they're certainly not living in the real planet in the real world. And it just makes you wonder about if they ever need to have the services or ever evolve or fire a first you know, organisation that we wish to turn off quick would be the fire and rescue service. <coughs> the way they're decimating the service.
information as detailed in the report. I agree. Thank you very much. Item 6. First, this report is to request members approve the proposed refresh of the Home Safety Strategy for 2015 um, particularly in regards to a targeted approach on the referral pathway. Uh, and the recommendations are that members consider the information contained within this report, <coughs> contain the proposal, and approve the Home Safety Strategy for implementation as recommended by the Performance and Scrutiny Committee. And this report was taken to the Performance and Scrutiny Committee and was taken then on to the authority. Based on just the employment, some of the positions that we're taking around diminishing resources uh, and making sure that we are part of our, our activity in the most appropriate places. And members will be aware that a lot of the work that we've undertaken more recently is targeted towards those <coughs> in our community, those who are over 65, those who live in the low. And the best and most effective way we can target those individuals is through direct referral from some of our partner agencies. We continue to work with adult social care and carers to identify those vulnerable individuals within the home. We also uh, have done a considerable amount of national work around data sharing protocols with some of our, our local authority and health partners, and we also utilise that exit to data to target those at-risk individuals, uh, at-risk of fire and fire death. And again, they are people who are 65 plus um, and live alone. And as Councillor Ayers referred to previously, we have seen <coughs> An increase in fire deaths more recently from an all time low of five. And we had phase 10, phase 10, <coughs> and we're currently at the level of eight now. So, you know, that doesn't very well. I think our targeted approach needs to make effective impact on that as we move forward with this amazing resource. We can no longer provide a universal provision to every householder across Merseyside. But also contained within the, the strategy is the application of professional judgment by our officers. So they are directed towards particular um, vulnerable individuals, but as they are undertaking their duties, if they come across people who wouldn't necessarily um, receive a home fire safety check and an intervention directly in relation to our target, they will be provided with that ability to intervene. So an example might be a single parent with four or five kids under the age of seven years of age. That would be something which we would use our professional judgment to ensure that they were protected if they didn't have any home fire safety check um, or any smoke alarms provided. So our activity is, is undertaken. It is a targeted approach. It is based on the fail in the first instance, use and application of, of data to target our risk. We would also focus on those uh, areas and localities where high levels of deprivation, because we know that, that if you have a, or live in a, an area of higher deprivation, you are more likely to have an accidental ground fire. And we would also hotspot areas following a fatal fa fa incident. And unfortunately, we've had a number of them more recently. So the report is contained within the appendices, um, and the strategy is, is there for members <coughs> to kind of consider with five, six various kind of principles there. So I'm happy to take any further questions on the <coughs> strategy. But as I say, the recommendations are that we approve the Home Safety Strategy um, for 2015 18. Um, just a couple of questions, really. Um, um, clearly, I defer to just earlier on as a trustee of the fire support network. Can you just be really involved about the interaction with them and with the fire service going forward? Um, the report itself, um, the couple of pages report, doesn't make any reference at all to <coughs> excuse me, fire support network. And there is um, scant reference to them within the main document of the strategy, really. And I do know that recently there may have been some discussion involving the data sharing protocols that the charity has with the fire service. And um, just really looking for assurances that um, whilst clearly those protocols are in place and they may well want refreshing, but also whether or not fire support, support network will be able to access some of the critical data which will make which will clearly then obviously enable them to carry forward the work that they do with their numerous volunteers. So um, just really looking, as I say, for assurances that uh, the fire support network will still be involved as, <coughs> excuse me for croaking, but it's a um, that they will be <coughs> used in the future um, you know, as one of the main providers of this essential service. And you know, if I have those assurances, then clearly I'd be happy to. 
to uh, endorse the safety strategy. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, to give you that reassurance, Fast Port Network are an integral part of our home safety strategy. And you'll see references within the report and certainly within the strategy itself, which talks about us um, evolving the home fire safety check into a, a safe and well visit, and a safe and well visit being a more holistic approach to risk in someone's home. So while I've specifically in previous years we've, we've targeted an individual around fire risk and we've been very narrow in our focus, we are expanding that to look at some of the other um, vulnerabilities of an individual <coughs> because as we well know, whether it be the fire service or the fire support network, we are able to cross <coughs> the thresholds of significantly more homes than any other public service to my knowledge. Um, and when we get into that home, it's incumbent on us to do everything we can to leave them safer than from when we leave to when we initially uh, enter the premises. And you know, the, the approach is one which has four elements to me, if I'm absolutely honest with you. It, it has our operational crews, we do a significant number, the vast majority of our home fire safety checks as currently are. <coughs> we even have our, our prevention teams who are focused on those really vulnerable individuals and the specialisms that they have in relation to age, dementia, you know, languages, etc. where language is a barrier, and um, fire service direct who core handle and, and direct our resources in the most appropriate way for the fire service <coughs> and the other elements of the strategy which is around um, the best utilisation of volunteers to have the biggest possible impact on the delivery of those services across uh, the whole of Merseyside and their role in saving well is, is, is probably more expansive than it has been up until the point in regards to home fire safety check. So it is a real reaffirmed in position that <coughs> platform net network on an integral part of the home safety strategy moving forward. Thank you, Chair. I just really wanted to comment on the on the ten fatalities that we had this year. So as other members know that one of those was a gentleman who lived in a house behind mine in Southport. And um, this property, we didn't even know that anybody was living there. It was extremely run down. It was, it was, uh, it was, it was a terrible situation afterwards, and had to be absolutely gutted um, inside and out. Uh, but what I wanted to say was how impressed I was that very quickly our firefighters came round and did a, a, did a, a, a check with everybody in the vicinity. I believe it was 364, was it not, <coughs> down the, the houses that were actually visited. I mean, this was the following day. They were out there on the street, and not only were they checking for people to have smoke detectors, they were also giving advice, which, of course, I was one of those. And I believe it was more than 200 smoke alarms were actually fitted in two days, which is concerning. I mean, obviously, I'm on safety and, and protection, so I have a lot of vested interest here. It is concerning, you know, that we've still got to get this message forward, and we're, we're all doing, I'm sure, our bit to do that. But I just wanted to thank very much the work that was done in Southport after that fatality, and how I have recently visited the residents in Poulton Road and Blair Road, where that fatality was in Poulton Road. I was with them a week ago, and how much more safe and secure they feel in their homes because our fire crews were out there speaking to them on the streets and going into their properties. So, the best of the best. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Thanks, Thanks Chair. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I fully, fully recommend this and, and support it. What I wanted to ask was, uh, under Priority 6, engaging with the private rented sector, um, they're usually the bane in our lives, for those of us who are sitting out telescopes <coughs> in our wards. And <coughs> I'm just wondering how this is, how this is actually um, panning out uh, to get these private landlords to comply um, because what, what we're seeing more and more of, although I'm not on, uh, on any planning committee then, but we're seeing more and more houses of multiple occupation coming through in some of our most, uh, shall we say, deprived areas in the city. So we're, and what we're getting as well as we're getting very vulnerable people under the ages of 65, maybe with, uh, with large families, large families with kids, um, particularly from the Polish and Roman communities. And, and it's, it's also getting that message across that for the safety of them, it seems that some of these private landlords just do exactly what they want. And uh, I'm just wondering how compliant are they being? Because it, it, as far as I'm concerned, 
I didn't know our law licensing scheme has as, as panned out as it's proven as good as it's supposed to have been. So there's, some of the, there's certainly some of the concerns that, that I've got. Just can we get into these properties? Because another thing that I'm seeing is in a lot of our tenants' properties, since the landlord licensing scheme came in in Liverpool, um, I'm seeing more and more of terrace properties going up for sale. So which suggests to me that they're trying to offer open them now. <coughs> so they're just some concerns. In response to that, um, just in regards to private land, apparently landlords have been more problematic for the fire and rescue service, certainly in regards to engagement and the extent to the local authority and the local authorities have come up with a number of schemes to kind of engage <coughs> the process and the discussions around <coughs> their tenants, not just specifically fire related, but the whole yeah. church of kind of, of issues. More recently, there's a legislative changes that were enacted on the first of April this year, which places a requirement now on a landlord, private landlord, to have smoke alarms installed in a property and have carbon monoxide alarms where there are solid fuel fires. Now, you know, we are working with and have been provided nationally with smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms to be able to distribute to those individuals, and we're sort to do that through a variety of communication channels and through the local authorities. And we continue to work with those local parties and those private landlords in that regard. The take up has been um, probably the best way to describe it, slow in the first instance. Uh, we, we know we've got probably around uh, got a significant number of, of, of properties in Merseyside which are privately owned, but we haven't had that same number of individuals come forward for the support, the advice, or indeed the, the alarms which we've we provided free of charge on this basis. Um, but the potential for an individual who doesn't comply, and, and let me be clear, the local authority have the legal <coughs> requirements to enforce in this regard, and um, it's only a matter of time that someone will fall foul of it, and it might not necessarily be through enforcement action through someone knocking on the door and checking. Uh, unfortunately, it might be as a result of a, a fire where we attend the premises where it's part of the, of the private landlord, uh, and we will take some action with the local authority at that particular Action will follow. And whether that is what's required to send out a real strong message around the goal of the <coughs> landlord, I don't know. We would hope they would take up the offer that is currently available um, through the Fire and Rescue Service um, to ensure the safety of their tenants. But be reassured if we do go to competitive thought, you know, a, fatal, you know, a fatal incident or <coughs> the other fire related incident where the private, the private landlord owns the property and someone is put at risk, then we will challenge that. Um, and just in regards to some of the kind of concerns over you know, specific groups of individuals and Polish Roma communities, um, again, the reassurance around specialisms that we currently hold, we have a Polish speaking advocate who works you know, tirelessly with their communities to ensure they are safe as well. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So, any other questions? Okay, can I just, uh, just echo the comments <coughs> from Leslie?